Welcome to The Riff. Today, Jeremy gets to sit down with Israeli tour guide, Ofer Ram, to talk about Jewish culture. They get to discuss Jesus, the Bible, Israel, and most importantly, they discuss Waffle House. We hope today is helpful. Thanks for listening. Welcome, Riff Raff, to another episode of The Riff, and I am here with one of our international YouTube subscribers to The Riff. I don't know if all that's true, <laughs> but Ofer Ram, Ofer, welcome to The Riff. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. Can you believe you're finally here? I am finally here. Can How you believe you, you finally got me here? Oh, my <laughs> word. You're, you're, you're agent, man. Good grief. We had to pick out all the green M&Ms. We yes. had to figure this out. Yes. Welcome. Thank you very much. Great uh, to be here. Yeah, we're, we're coming to you live from the international headquarters of The Riff, uh, just on the northern side of Springfield, Missouri. Um, and Ofer, uh, today's kind of a special show. This is a, a tribute um, where you've been invited to share uh, several moments of what you best appreciate about our friendship. And so <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, but I do consider us to be good friends. Would you Absolutely. consider us to be good friends? Absolutely. Good. Yes. <laughs> that was going to be awkward. So, um, okay. So let me give a little backstory for those who have no idea about this love uh, yes. that we we are just we expressing. We share. Yes. Um, is I met Ofer probably five years ago. Um, you are a tour guide uh, for our trip to Israel, and so Ofer, tell us a little bit about you. Where are you from? Uh, I was born in Israel. But where were you raised? I was raised in Philadelphia. What part of Philadelphia? West, <laughs> West side of Philadelphia. Philly, born and raised. <laughs> born, yeah. Not born, but raised. Okay, <laughs> where did you playground. spend most of your days? <laughs> on the playground okay. is where I spent most of my days. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. <laughs> so, it's true also. Five years in Philadelphia when, when I was young. Yeah. Um, ever since uh, eighth grade, end of eighth grade, I went back to Israel, lived there ever since. I did my military service in the Israeli Navy. I was a naval medic. I traveled a little bit around the world. I did nothing for a while. My parents thought I'm lazy at the age of 23, 4, doing nothing at home watching TV. So they told me to go do something. Um, figured traveling is fun. Maybe I'll learn something about Israel if I'll become a tour guide. And turns out it was a lot of fun. And okay. uh, I've been a tour guide ever since. Married, three grown children, 2018 and 16. And uh, right now there are no tours in Israel, so I'm here. Yeah, well, in the US. we are glad that we get a chance to have a conversation with you, even Thank though you. there's no tours. Matter of fact, we are scheduled to go on a tour in April. Yes, um, I'm hoping that actually uh, happens. That would be phenomenal. And yes. if not, we'll do one as soon as later. We can. Uh, yeah, sure. So, um, so now, okay, so you uh, you went to school to be a tour guide. So in Israel, um, tour guide's kind of a thing. I mean, tourism Big is thing. the number one industry or a, a top uh, it's industry. It's one of the top three all the time. Yes. Okay. When so, we have tourism. Okay. <laughs> um, one of the industries in Israel is. Um, uh, Wonder Woman, right? <laughs> like she's Israeli. Yes, she is Israeli. Gal Gadot. She's one of our our best uh, our best inventions. Okay, yes. very good. Congratulations <laughs> on that. You. Yes. Are you related to her? No. Ah, I tell everybody I'm friends of her cousin. Good. That's all right. You. That's all right. Um, okay, so uh, you grow up, you know of tour tourism and tour guides. So, what does it take to become a tour guide in Israel? Uh, you have to do. Any one of a number of courses. Mine was about two years worth of uh, university classes. And at the end, no matter which course you take, you have to do a government exam, which starts out with a written test. And if you pass that, you do an oral test and you're kind of standing in front of four professionals in their field. And they get to ask you questions about anything really that has to connect, that has any kind of connection with Israel. Okay. okay. And if you pass enough, you know, you answer. Enough of their questions in uh, at least half a, a true way, then it's okay. Okay, so the rest you just make up. Uh, how, how long you been a tour guide now? I've been a tour guide since twenty oh two, so twenty one okay. years now as a tour wow. guide with uh, an actual license. Okay, yeah, best one I've ever had. Thank you very and much, and not the only one either. So, thank you. Um, matter of fact, Ofer is such a good tour guide. His schedule is in such high demand that we got to book him early. So yes, I dig it. Uh, okay, so Ofer, uh, tell us. Okay, can you walk through? Um, I've heard you share it this way. There's uh, being an Israeli, a Jew, uh, kind of in a in a broad sweep. What are the different types of 
Jews out there, right? Yeah, as far as you're I'm talking about just the Jewish world. Yeah, the Jewish world. No problem. Um, sure. The Jewish world today is uh, segmented, just like uh, in Christianity, where you have the Catholics and you have the Orthodox, and then you have uh, the Greek Orthodox, and you have the Russian Orthodox, and then you have the Protestant movement, and they're split up amongst themselves with all different denominations. We have the same idea in Judaism. Um, for the most part, Religious Jews are those who accepted rabbinical understanding of what needs to be done when there is no temple. Okay. Jewish law, for the most part anyway, um, deals with how we treat each other, but it also has how we treat with God. And so they, they take a lot of that, most of the Old Testament, most yes. of their laws come from the Old Testament. Old Testament, and there's also the oral law, which a lot of people don't realize, but uh, the oral law that was given by Moses, um, when he comes down with the Ten Commandments, it was given to the entire congregation. It was passed down generation to generation, father to son, father to son. And it's as important as the written law. There's, it's not that the written law is more important than the oral law. Um, and, all of the, and all of the laws that have to do with the temple, we can't do them anymore because there's no temple for the past 2,000 years. So the rabbis at some point after the destruction of the temple sat down, understood that we need a replacement system. And they came up with something. This is what we call today prayer. Okay. Okay. So instead of a morning public offering at the temple for the benefit of all the Jews that cannot make it to the temple in that morning, let's say you live in Springfield and I it'll take you, take you six to eight months to get to Israel. You're not going to be there every morning to give a sacrifice. They gave a sacrifice at the temple once every single morning for the benefit of all those who cannot make it to the temple. Okay. They did it in the evening as well. And instead of giving an offering at the temple because we don't have a temple, the rabbis decreed that we're going to pray. Everybody, so, every Jew. Every Jew should pray. And there was actually this incredible miracle in the Jewish world. Now, I don't know if you've ever heard this before, but if you have two Jews, you, odds are you have three opinions. Okay. <laughs> so when we are talking about a consensus in the Jewish world where all the rabbis agree on anything, that's, Big the, deal. that's a miracle. Okay. And they agreed that prayer is a legitimate replacement system. Okay. They didn't agree on how we pray. Um, which verses we're going to take. Is it going to be from Genesis book one or from Leviticus book three? Um, they didn't agree, do we incorporate music into our, uh, into our prayer system? Are you a pro music guy? I'm a very pro music guy. I think music is uh, really a, an incredible language. So absolutely, I love singing, even though I might not be a big singer. Uh, in the shower mostly, probably. No, I heard you. you, you're staying at our house and I heard you across, but I, I thought it was beautiful. <laughs> I was trying to, to keep it on the down low. Okay. Um, so we have this rabbinical understanding. Okay. So if you accept that rabbinical understanding, you are already considered a religious Jew. Okay. And things are pretty much how they go for over a thousand years, even 1800 years. And then about 150, 200 years ago, we start seeing the idea of modernity in life. Yeah. This starts mostly in Europe. We see a movement from agricultural life into city life. We have the Industrial Revolution. We have uh, electricity being created. We have all these gadgets nowadays, like vacuum cleaners. I don't know if oh, you yeah. know what that is. Oh, they're awesome. Uh, yeah. I, yeah. Radio, television. Yeah. These very Seen strange them. things that the Jewish world had to decide what we're going to do with it. Are we going to adapt to this new reality of modernity or are we not? And there were quite a few different reactions to modernity. And one of them was, this is the worst thing that could happen to the Jewish world. The reaction of this group would be the ultra-Orthodox. They are the ones who usually you see, you can pick them out in a lineup because they'll have that black suit, the white shirt, the tie and the top hat. They usually have the, the longer beards, at least the men will have it. Um, <laughs> Some of the women have mustaches. Maybe, maybe. But, um, but, but they're very easy to, to see outside because the way they dress. Yes. They kind of have the Amish look to yeah. them. Um, and they're the so ones that said not only in, in uh, Israel, I mean, you'll see cities, absolutely. big cities all over the here, place, New York. This is true for almost every Jewish person around the world. These reactions, okay. he, whether they know that this is a reaction or not nowadays is different, but, um, the reaction was modernity is the worst thing that could happen to okay. us. We can't have our kids uh, affected by this because then they'll drop all of the traditions that we grew up on. So we'll close ourselves in our own communities. We'll try as much as we can to avoid the idea of modernity. And we'll adhere to these old traditions that we know and love. Yeah. 
A completely different reaction on the opposite scale was what you call a secular Jew, which is where I fall in, I guess. Um, we pick and choose the traditions we want, but we thought that modernity is the best thing that could happen. Not only do I have one cell phone, I have three cell phones. Not that I do, but I can if I want to. Yeah. And I don't need anymore to wear a yarmulke on my head uh, to show that I'm Jewish. I can just wear a baseball cap. Uh, or I just don't wear a baseball cap because I don't want that tradition. Wearing a hat or wearing a yarmulke, as it's called, that little circle on the people's head, is a tradition. It is not a Jewish law. Um, I was circumcised when I was eight days old. I was bar mitzvah because my parents chose that as a tradition that we want. We have a Friday night dinner like uh, the religious people do, and we bless the wine and we bless right the bread. Right before the Sabbath. Right before the Sabbath, but once we're done... Th- Eating, we'll watch TV and we'll drive back home, which the ultra-Orthodox obviously will not do because you're not supposed to drive on Shabbat. So, so you celebrate, as a secular Jew, you'll still celebrate some culture, traditions, and absolutely, worship. Absolutely. Absolutely. I will you're celebrate not bound Passover. To Old Testament. But I grew up in a house where my father said that it is uh, kosher to eat unleavened bread on okay. Passover, but it's tasty to eat pita bread. <laughs> How about so, your dad? Yeah. So we're, I'm not a food biased. So, I will eat kosher as well. Okay. Okay. So if you give me kosher food, I won't say no. If you give me non-kosher food, can, I won't say no. Can we no. put some bacon on it? You can put, bacon makes everything better as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> so. Yeah. Okay. Um, so you've got, you've got um, traditional Jews, yes. um, which would be Old Testament vibe. Um, kind of, of uh, laws sure. and and they stand out from modern day. You got secular Jews. Yes. Um, and then- And then you have somewhere in the middle. Okay. Those who said that modernity is not that bad of a thing. Traditional life is not that bad of a thing. We're going to bring them together. Okay. And we're going to have a cell phone and we're going to have internet access in our homes and we're going to drive our cars everywhere and email our friends um, offshore or whatever it is. But come Friday evening, for example- just before Shabbat starts, for 25 hours, we are going to shut down Why the 25? electrical. Because you don't want to overstep Shabbat. So you start a little bit before just Shabbat in comes in, just have. in case. A lot of religious uh, um, things that the Jewish people do is just in case. So here's what we know is not allowed. So now let's put the fence a little bit further exactly. away so we don't this is accidentally actually break called, the law. It's actually called fencing. Okay. Not fencing with swords, but fencing or geofencing by like you drive by, you get an advertisement. A, yes, by building a fence around the actual law. Yes, so okay. that you don't trespass. God forbid, you don't do something that you're not supposed to. Is that why we have ten laws from God to Moses, and then now there's six hundred thirteen laws? Is because of a lot of it is fencing, or no? Or is it six thirteen? Am I right? No, on the six hundred and thirteen rules and regulations are given by God in the text. This okay. is this is given there. Um, what we um, define them as or explain them or try to understand them as um, is very different. Again, two Jews, three opinions, and one, one rabbi will say X, one rabbi will say gotcha. B. And then you have to find where, where, that, where you fall in line. By the way, that's one of the greatest things about Judaism and one of the worst things about Judaism. You go to a rabbi, you ask a question, you get an answer. Yeah. Absolutely get an answer. <laughs> you go to a different rabbi, ask the exact same question, you'll get a completely different answer. And then it's up to you to decide which rabbi you want to follow. And even back uh, when we study um, the context of uh, the day that Jesus was walking, it, what was that? You had to find the different yoke, the different interpretation, of the different course. expectations of a rabbi. One of the most famous sayings, almost every saying that Jesus has is that you have heard it say, and I say unto you. Because one rabbi said something and Jesus is saying, well, you've heard Rabbi Ofer say one thing and I'm telling you that the way that you're supposed to read the text and the way that you're supposed to interpret the text later on is a little bit different. And reading the text has an infinite um, possibilities. Uh, What we are doing today in our modern Bible, both in Hebrew and in the English version of the Bible, we have basically decided how to read the text. What do I mean by that? I'm sure that you will understand if I say the three English words, let's eat grandpa. I know all three of those words. Uh, You do? Yes. Okay, so there's something missing in these three words that will completely change the meaning of the words without interpretation, just the way I read them. And that's called punctuation. And the problem is that in the ancient scripture of, of the Jewish people, there is no punctuation whatsoever. 
what we have is a big paragraph. It starts here, it ends here. And then when a rabbi reads that ancient text, he gets to choose where he starts, where he ends, where he puts the comma, where he puts the period exclamation point or yeah. all the other um, grammatical things that we added, that today are added already into the text. Yeah. So when somebody comes to you and says, let's <clears throat> eat grandpa, you will say, yes, you can read it like that. But wouldn't it make more sense if we say, let's eat, comma, grandpa? Instead of, I want to eat grandpa, it's, I want to eat. Grandpa, uh, you want to eat? Little known fact about me, and this is absolutely true. My descendants, no, not my descendants, my ancestors. ancestors. Okay, well, I don't, maybe my descendants <laughs> as well. My ancestors were part of the Donner's Pass. Are you familiar with the Donner's Pass? I don't think so. Well, just to put it clearly, is that means let's eat grandpa might not have had punctuation in it. <laughs> so they had a, you know, desperate times call for desperate Definitely. measures. Um, so anyway, but yes, punctuation should be important. Absolutely. So yeah. now what the rabbis are trying to do, and this is what Jesus is a part of, is they're trying to decide how is the more right way of reading the text? If you yeah. can read the text, if it's there and it's black and white, then you're not wrong. This is why we always say that rabbis are never wrong. They're just not always right. And what happens is if a rabbi can convince other rabbis of his time that he is more right than them by showing them that it, uh, it makes sense because in the next passage, it collaborates what, corroborates what they're saying. Yeah. If I can convince my friend Rabbi Jeremy here, that mm. my way is more right than yours, I become a great rabbi. Okay. And yeah. when you look at the text, when you see what Jesus is talking about, you see that his way of reading the text is incredible. Uh, you see that already when he's 12 years old and he's coming to the temple in Jerusalem with his parents for one of the, uh, uh, one of the holidays, one of the pilgrimage holidays, his parents forgot him. Now, never mind how you forget a 12-year-old son while walking nine or 10 hours to Jericho. And only once you get to Jericho, you find out that he's missing. They're not bad parents. There's a reason for that. But when they come back and they finally find him, they see him on the temple mount and the rabbis He's asking them questions. They're asking him questions. He's asking, he's replying with his, uh, his questions. There's no such thing as question and answer in Judaism. You ask me a question, question and I, question. I reply. I don't answer back. I reply with another question. Um, and the way that he's phrasing his questions shows those rabbis that this is a truly gifted child, yeah. that he is showing them that you can read the text in ways they didn't even think about. He is a prodigy. In, yeah. the, in the Jewish world. Okay, so talk to us a little bit about um, how important um, understanding the, the culture of uh, first century um, Israel was for someone who picks up a Bible now and starts reading about well, anything, the life of Jesus. Why is culture important? Well, first of all, once you understand the culture, once you understand the rules of engagement, once you understand Roman culture, because that was a big part of the life back in those days, you read the text in a completely different meaning. Uh, we, we like to say that the Bible was written for you, but not to you. Um, the Bible. I, I totally agree with you, <laughs> but that makes a lot of people clench. Either I know. their teeth or their body. That's okay. okay. I have no problem say with that. Say it again. Say it again. The Bible was written for you. It was not written to you. Mm. Yes. The truth will set you free. It but will. First, it'll punch you in the neck. It will. In Israel, uh, if we say anything that offends anybody, that's fine because they have the right to be offended and we have the right not to care. Okay. It's, uh, it's fine. Break that down a little bit. So when you say the Bible is written to me, but not for me. Yes. What does that mean? Yeah. What does it mean? So when Jesus is speaking to the crowd 2,000 years ago, they know the laws, not just the Jewish laws. They know the Roman laws of that time. So he doesn't need to break it down for them. And when he speaks of turning the other cheek, uh, if somebody hits you on the left cheek and you need to turn the other cheek, in our Western uh, world right now, when we read that, this is a sign of non-aggression, for example. Oh, you, you don't need to uh, make things worse by hitting him back. Uh, but if you understand the culture and the rules back in those days, you actually understand that this is a way that Jesus is using Roman military law against the Romans. R Jesus has been calling for a rebellion since the time he was able to. He is calling for the kingdom of heaven to be the rule of law in the land of Israel. The rule of law in the land of Israel during his time is the Roman rule Roman of law. law yeah. So if I'm calling for any kind of a different uh, law, I need to get the Roman law out of my way. I have to 
oust them somehow. I have to rebel against them. Um, it might not be, okay, everybody pick up stones and start throwing it at the Roman military. But there are ways, subtle ways, just like a Gandhi version of a rebellion, that we can use Roman law against the Romans. And that idea of turning the other cheek is one of the most uh, uh, well-known ones back in those days. Because a Roman military soldier is actually allowed to hit you in the street for no reason whatsoever. Just because they're a Roman soldier. Yes. And if the text says that he hits you on the left cheek, since most of us are right-handed, hitting somebody on the left cheek with your right hand means a backhanded slap. And that is even more degrading for the person getting the slap. You are beneath me. You're not my equal. I'm not even going to um, to hit you the proper way. So yeah. if I have one slap to give, I'm going to backhand slap you on your left cheek. And what is Jesus saying now? Turn the other cheek. Taunt yeah. this Roman soldier, not only to see you as an equal, because then if he hits you again, it'll be on your left cheek, right? Right, yeah. Uh, that means he sees you as an equal, but... In case he does hit you, he gets in trouble. You've just baited him across the exactly. line and now you have power. The Roman military law states you're allowed to hit him once. Not Hitting twice. you twice means the Roman soldier gets in trouble. Yeah. So these are subtle things that the Jewish people 2000 years ago who are listening to Jesus understand because they understand the rules and we don't. So I, th I think a key, the, the, the biggest key for um, my encouragement to anybody listening is when you pick up the Bible, you need to figure out what did it mean to the original hearers, listeners, the original exactly. listeners. What, so what did it say? What did it mean to them in their setting? And only when I understand that can I now interpret what does it mean to me because it's super dangerous yes. to just pick it up and say without context. Here's so, another cultural thing. Give it to me. You keep, uh, you keep hearing that Jesus is being challenged by the Pharisees. A Pharisee is a Jewish person 2000 years ago who belongs to a specific school of thought. Let's call it that. And even in that school of thought, we have a lot of different rabbis who will uh, think differently. Um, and they're challenging Jesus. They're confronting him with questions. But this is a part and parcel of day-to-day -day rabbinical life back in those days. They have heard their rabbi say, and now they want to hear Jesus's understanding, Jesus's interpretation, Jesus's way of reading the text. And they're not challenging him to make him fail. They're challenging him to see what he has to say about the same subject. Because again, Jewish rabbis are never wrong. They're just not always right. And maybe Jesus's way of reading the text or interpreting the text or whatever it is that they're asking him, maybe that is more right than what they've heard a different rabbi say. And we want to get to the bottom of it. As a matter of fact, if you look at 3000 years of Jewish scholarship and Jewish rabbinical thought, what they're doing is they're trying to move the comma after every single word to see if it makes more sense so that we, we can read the Bible in the, mo in the most right way that we can. Yeah. And we have been arguing about this for 3000 years and yeah. they're still arguing about it. This is what they do in yeshiva, which is the uh, ultra Orthodox or the religious uh, uh, universities across the world. Okay, so um, let me let me walk through um, uh, some rapid fire questions here. So, a Messianic Jew, um, a lot of uh, um, uh, Americans will, if, if they know Jew, especially because of the culture that we have, a lot of times you would understand Messianic Jew would be. Tell me if I'm explaining this right. Someone who believes Jesus was the Messiah, but ha is Jewish in either uh, culture, uh, race, um, but has embraced Jesus as the risen Messiah. Yes. Okay. Exactly. Uh, um, a traditional Jew or a secular Jew would be Jewish in culture, maybe Jewish in theology, but not attribute Messiahship to Jesus. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So what would, as you as a secular Jew, what would a Messiah look like? Son of David. Okay. Like just descendant lineage, of David, family tree. lineage. Ba, 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 ba. It could be me. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, Traditionally, be, my family is a out. descendant of David. We are on the riff. <laughs> I think if this is true, this might be the time to tell us. <laughs> there are different thoughts about Messiah in, uh, in Judaism. One of okay. which is that in every generation, there is a Messiah. The question is, will he present himself? Uh, since the Messiah mm. basically needs to be the descendant of David, and there are quite a few, um, will he present himself? That's one version of, uh, of traditional Jewish thought. Uh, there are other Jewish thoughts. When the time is right, 
the God will let us know that this is the Messiah and, and we will know. Um, Have you ever in your lifetime felt like, I'm curious, is that person a potential Messiah? Not really. Personally, we're talking about. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, it's not something that I dwell on on a day-to-day uh, life. This is something that some religious people will, uh, religious Jewish people will will talk about and, and wait for. We have groups, organizations that are absolutely sure that the days of the Messiah are upon us. And they are actively teaching the Kohanim, the priests uh, of the Jewish people, what they're supposed to do once the temple will be rebuilt. They are uh, sewing Kohanim garments. So everything will be ready because and once these Messiah are, these comes, are the there will be another temple. These are described in scripture or the, the high, the high priest, priest is a specific, specific priest. person yes. who has a specific role. Who's we from have, the Kohanim? He's from a specific line of Kohanim family. The, okay. In theory, he's supposed to be the uh, eldest son of Aaron and then the eldest son of Aaron's child and then the eldest son and then the eldest son. So if you are from the direct descendancy of Aaron himself, then you are a part of the high priest family. Uh, but there are other Kohanim families. Uh, Kohen is what you call a priest, even though it's not exactly the same thing. A Kohen is like a Jewish last name. You either belong to that family or you don't. And I is might that know, a specific part of the tribe of Levi? Yes, yep. because the other part is the Levites. Okay. Yep. Now, if your last name is Levi or Levi, then you're a Levi. If your last name is Cohen or Katz, Katz would be Kohen Tzedek. It's like an acronym, uh, a just Kohen. Kohen Tzedek, just Kohen. Then you know, for example, that you are a Kohen. Katzenberg, all sorts of uh, derivatives of that idea. Kofax? So we, Sandy Kofax? No, Sandy not Kofax. No, okay. no. He might be known, but he's not a... <laughs> he was the not, Dodgers not, Messiah. Not that I know anyway. <laughs> yeah. So we basically know who the Kohanim is, are. Okay. We basically know who the Levites are. Those are the more important parts of what we need when a temple will be rebuilt. Okay, or let's talk come down from heaven. So, so if we're talking future events, we're talking um, for those who are waiting for Messiah. Yes. Um, the temple is a key figure. Yes. What if someone just said, "I am starting a construction project, and it will be the temple"? Is that enough, or does it have to be a divine? What What would have Again, to happen? With, with, in Jewish thought, there is no one answer. Okay. And therefore, some people think that when the time comes, the temple will come down from the heavens as a one big block of a building and just situate itself wherever it is. Others have a. And as at I said, that point, if that happened tomorrow, you'd be like, "I'm in. Game on." Oh Let's yeah, do it. I'm, I'm going to say goodbye to all of my uh, lecture appointments that I have here in the United States. I'll catch the first flight back to Israel and stand in line to, to give my uh, thanks to God. Absolutely. We'll stop eating I'm a huge believer in God. <laughs> I'll stop eating bacon burgers. <laughs> um, I am a huge believer in God. I just don't adhere to the religious understandings right. because, uh, because I studied, not yep. because I don't like them. Right. And... If there's something that all of a sudden from your studies becomes right in front of you, you're like, I'm, I'm ready. Oh, I'm yes. In. Yeah. Um, okay. So what about end times events from a secular Jew uh, standpoint is, do you look, well, what do you look to the end? Is there end times events? Is that a big part of it or no? Again, it's not something that I dwell on. Um, being a tour guide, I get these questions once in a while. And I just say, every time I'm being asked this, I have the same answer. When the time comes, I'll let you know. Okay. That's all I can do. <laughs> okay, I got some, I got some uh, basic tour guide uh, working with Americans. Now, there's this trope out there. There's this idea, this image that there are Americans, the stereotype, Americans who travel and go to Israel for tours. I'm sure... Um, I'm sure we asked some dumb stuff, okay? What's the <laughs> dumbest thing you've seen an American tourist do? Let's say on the oh, Sea of Galilee. God. <laughs> Tell us that story. Yeah, that's number one on the list for sure. So uh, when we have Christian tours, it doesn't matter if they're Catholic or Protestant, all, almost every single Christian tour goes on a boat ride on the oh, Sea yeah. of Galilee. And you for sure will Absolutely. if you go with me. Absolutely. And we have, uh, sometimes we have not just a, a one bus tour. Uh, this specific event happened with a four bus tour. So we had over 180 people. And the boats can hold maybe 190 people. So we Is had to have TD two. TD Jakes bringing everyone over there? Uh, Who no, brings 180 people? He brought 180 people. <laughs> okay, okay. And we had two boats. 
And the pastor wow. who's in charge of it all likes to uh, talk about events while he's on the boat in the Sea of Galilee. I like that too. And one of the uh, most famous events that takes place on the Sea of Galilee is, of course, Jesus walking on water. Yes. And, Jesus, and uh, the pastor starts explaining that Jesus was walking on water and the, and the disciples saw him and Peter asks Jesus to, to join him on the water and, and Jesus says, yes, absolutely, come on. And he gets out of the boat and he starts walking on the water. And at some point, whether it was the wind or he looked down and didn't understand how it is possible, how it's possible that he's walking on water, he started to sink. And Jesus had to pick him up or uh, give him a hand to to bring him back up. And the pastor explains that it was because of the lack of faith. Mm. He started doubting. <laughs> now the the pastor is continuing. He's with the microphone, and again we have 180 people. And suddenly we start hearing, "I believe." I have faith. <laughs> and then we hear, bloop. Oh, no. Now, it takes a little bit of time to understand with 180 people and the pastor is still talking on the microphone, what is going on? Turns out that somebody thought he can walk on water and he stepped off the boat and apparently he couldn't walk on water. <laughs> now, to make things even more hilarious, because at this point I'm on the floor laughing, he can't swim. Oh, uh and That's he's, rich. He's over. flapping his hands, and I'm hysterical, laughing. On I, I, you know, other people's misfortunes are the funniest thing in the world. Uh, <laughs> I, I have to say that. You know, you see somebody running for a bus, kind of waving at the bus driver, running, running. Bam! Hits a post. Come on, that's funny. That's right? good. That's funny. Yeah, that's, that's so good. this guy's flapping his hands and they throw him a, a, a life vest, not a life vest. A, a ringy, uh, a buoy. Sure, a buoy, whatever. And they start picking him up. And just then, just like in biblical prophecies, the winds come in and the boat starts rocking left and right. This is when back in those days, Jesus would have calmed the, the waters. Yeah. So this guy is now hitting the side of the boat oh. as we're pulling him up. And when he's finally on back on the boat and they put, um, I don't know, a jacket or a, I don't know what they had to warm him up a little bit, the pastor takes the mic and he says, perfect example of why you don't test God. That's good. That's good. <laughs> so that's my number one story of, um, of events that just was hysterical. That's, hysterical. I like that. Yeah. Uh, so you've been in America. So we're just doing quick overtime here. Yes. Uh, you've been in America quite a bit, but uh, uh, what do you think of Waffle House? Give us a little Yelp review. We were there this morning. It, yes. And I think it had some of the best, uh, not tater tots. What was it that I had? Um, the, um, the potato thing. Yeah. You had what is it um, hash browns. Hash browns. Yeah. Some of the best hash browns I ever had. Really? Yes. Wow. Uh, I was introduced to something I never dreamt of. Tell us. That is possible yeah. in this world. Yeah. They, they showed me an apple butter. Well, I, apple I, butter think, I think, or? I don't know if it would be a singular A apple butter. I think apple butter. Apple butter. It's a thing. It's it's a thing. Is, apparently um, it's a thing. And, and I've you, never seen when it before. When I ordered it, because I ordered it with my wheat toast yes. and for your white toast, yes. you know, but then you changed it to raisin. Um, I did. Uh, <laughs> you were like, apple butter, that sounds delicious. <laughs> yeah, and but you it's, it's like it jam. And your eyes changed. Yes, because it looked like jam, not butter. It is jam. It I got to tell jam. you, it's not butter. Okay, it's not butter. That's, that's what um, it looks like. Okay. Uh, what is your uh, favorite American uh, music artist? I don't know that I have a favorite American music artist. I like different types of music. I like different types of songs from different artists. I need you to pick one. My go-to would be probably Guns N' Roses, Sweet Child of Mine. Uh, that's like number one on my on my song list. Is it really? It is. Yes. Very good. Okay. Um, uh, question for you is um, Chick-fil-A yes. uh, seems to be Look at my a eyes big open. thing for you. Um, how... <laughs> How many days in a row would be enough for you to eat Chick-fil-A? Well, I've been here since October 26th. That means I'm here for about three weeks now. And aside from Sundays, on average, I probably ate once a day. Yeah. All right. We will do that today, by the uh, way. Of course. We yeah. must. Yeah. Can't, I don't want to uh, break the streak. No, you went to Bass Pro. <laughs> I did, um, but that you, was five months ago. Yeah, that I might was, have to go again to just to remember what it's like. What, what do you remember most about Bass Pro? Was oh, it something yeah. you told all your Israeli friends as soon as you got off the airport when Absolutely you came back? Not. Like, no, 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 no. Do you remember what was there? Yes, everything. Yes, everything, everything. was there. Literally everything from shoelaces to boats. 
Yeah. To guns and um, uh, crossbows, <laughs> knives, yeah. Yeah. and uh, just everything. It was unbelievable. Um, uh, tell me, uh, do you think spring... I got a hat from there. You did? <laughs> you did. You did. <laughs> um, so now the Bass Pro, the problem is you got to watch those Bass Pro hats because the stickers, the B falls off and then okay. you feel really silly. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding, Bass Pro. Um, so, uh, okay, tell me, tell me this. Um, I'm going to give you multiple choice. Yes. Does Springfield, Missouri have A, um, not enough churches, B, <laughs> the right amount of churches, or C, maybe a few too many churches? I would go with uh, D, D? Uh, one too many churches. <laughs> one too many. Is it North Point? <laughs> I hope not. I hope not too. <laughs> I'm supposed to be there tonight. <laughs> okay, Ofer, um, we're going to pretend that we're going to have you back next week for next week's episode. Excellent. But just between you and me, we're just going to hit stop and then re-record -re again. All right. So next week, ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen that's going to be dropped christmas on special a christmas special <laughs> called ofer ruins christmas <laughs> so you want to dial into all the things your parents told you about that are lies <laughs> built on a throne of lies and so it, it'll be the the ofer who stole christmas this time <laughs> the ofer <laughs> who stole christmas that's going to be the title all right all right ofer okay we're going to go to chick-fil-a we'll be right back Absolutely. thanks for listening riff raff thanks for having me Thanks for listening to this episode of The Riff. We'll have a brand new episode every week, wherever you find podcasts.